I'm so glad you're here this evening. We are going to continue our study in one of the easiest sections of the Bible for me. <laughs> Revelation chapter 8, the seven trumpets. Now, please don't be discouraged if you're not getting it all. Please. Because, again, this is a very challenging piece of the Bible. Just remember, there is a main message here, a main message that God is giving to us. And I want us to understand that message foundationally. Then the rest of it, yes, you might see some of this, you might see some of that, that's okay. The main message is Jesus Christ. He is the one that introduces the trumpets, and he comes first. That's what we've learned. Before the trumpets are sounded, Jesus is presented to us, and he's presented to us in a powerful way. Let's just do a little bit of review. What I'm thinking we're going to do is we're going to review as we start, then we're going to go a little further in our series, and then we're going to review as we finish. So we'll get as much repetition as we can so that we can have every opportunity to understand this. So we'll start with a little bit of review. Here's the outline that we've studied so far in Revelation. Revelation chapter 8 begins in verse 2, not in verse 1, verse 2, and I saw. That's the phrase that introduces the vision of the seven trumpets. The seven seals have taken us all the way through to the second coming of Jesus. Now John sees another vision, and it begins with these angels that are given seven trumpets. Then immediately we're directed to Christ's mediation in the heavenly sanctuary. So we see in Revelation 8 to the introduction to the trumpets, and then we see Christ in the heavenly sanctuary symbolized there as mediating in our behalf. Then we have in Revelation 8 verse 5 a response to his mediation. Now notice this. We're going back to John's time in the book of Revelation. God told him, I'm going to give you things that have been, that are happening, and that are going to happen. And I'm going to show you things, he says in Revelation, that must shortly come to pass. That means that Revelation's visions begin in John's time with things that were shortly to come to pass. And they take us on from there. So we have some things that have happened, John's looking back at, then some things that are happening at his time, and then we're going all the way down through history to the second coming of Jesus. Now, the mediation of Christ begins in Revelation chapter 8 in the holy place. We know that. Why? Because he presents the prayers of God's people before the golden altar. And the golden altar was in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So that tells us that the introduction to the trumpets gives us history pre-1844. Everything that's taking place in the trumpets before we get to Revelation chapter 10 is before the year 1844. It's in the holy place. It's where the golden altar is. It's where the horns of the golden altar are. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. So, Revelation 8 verse 6. Revelation 8 verse 5, we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is not in the grave. Isn't that what the pastor said tonight? Where is he then? If the grave is empty, where is he? He's in heaven. And what's he doing there? He's interceding for us. What are we asking for? What were the early disciples asking for? They wanted the Holy Spirit. They're praying for the Holy Spirit. They're praying as Jesus asked them to do. And as they pray, their prayers ascend. Jesus applies his righteousness, his merit. And then he takes fire, that's a symbol of the Holy Spirit, off the altar, and he casts it into the earth. And we see a response to that. We see voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. This is the power, the presence that is found around the throne of God. So Revelation chapter 8 verse 5, the Holy Spirit Pentecost symbolized Revelation 8 verse 6, then the warning messages prepare to sound. They can't sound until the world is warned. God doesn't do anything until he first delivers his message through his servants, the prophets. Noah, 120 years, preaching the gospel, talking about the flood that was coming and offering a way of salvation in the ark. God does the same thing in the early apostolic age. He's going to do the same thing. He is doing the same thing right now. There's another ark to build. You know that. There's another storm coming. You know that. And God has a people today who are giving the warning message, calling people into the safety of the ark, the presence of Jesus Christ. So then we learned, as we continued on in Revelation 8, verse 7, about the fall of Jerusalem. That was the first judgment that comes after the apostolic age. Because remember, we're following history now. 
We started in John's time. We've started in the time of the apostolic church. We're moving down through history. The first judgment announces the fall of Jerusalem. Jesus predicted that in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Not one stone will be left upon another. Remember, the Jews divorced themselves from God. They said, we have no king but Caesar. They became part of the Roman Empire, and those judgments begin with the Roman Empire. The Jews were part of that. And so first we see Jerusalem fall, and we see that symbolized in that first trumpet. Tonight we're going to be looking at the second trumpet, Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9, the fall of pagan Rome, the compromise that takes place in the Christian church as pagan Rome falls and paganism comes into the Christian church and begins to meld with Christianity. And we've seen the result of that all the way down through the centuries to our time. So that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. So let's, again... Uh, look at the repeat and enlarged structure of Revelation, the churches, the seals, and the trumpets. If you look here at this slide, you're going to find that the seven churches begin with the first church, that's Ephesus, and that under the Ephesus church, we have the gospel going to all the world. This is the apostolic age. Then you go to repeat and enlarge in the seals. The first seal is open, and we see a white horse going forth conquering and to conquer. That white horse represents the gospel being preached to all the world. It is, again, the apostolic era, the apostolic church. Then we come to the seven trumpets. In the prelude to the trumpets, before they begin to sound, we see Pentecost. We see the fire being cast into the earth. We see voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So again, we're seeing the gospel going to all the world. We're seeing the apostolic era. Each one of these visions is parallel to the other, each one of them repeating and enlarging upon the other. Just like Daniel 2 has the image of the four parts, and then we have Daniel 7, the four beasts, then we have Daniel 8, the repeat and enlarge of the same. They're different, a little bit different in their images. Here's an image of a, of a, of a man with a head of gold and, and breast of silver and thighs of brass and, and legs of iron. And then in the next vision, you have these four animals, but they're still representing the same kingdoms. And then in the next vision, you have two different animals and a little horn, but it still represents those same kingdoms. The same thing is happening here in the book of Revelation. You have churches, you have seals, you have trumpets, but they're still representing the same series, the same era, the same time frame of history. Each one is giving us a little bit more insight as it repeats and enlarges upon the other. And we'll see that more clearly as we continue on. So we get into tonight the second church, which is Smyrna. That parallels the second horse, which is the red horse, and that parallels the first and second trumpet, which is the fall of Jerusalem and the fall of pagan Rome, and that's going to be the pagan Roman Empire or era. That's what we're going to be covering tonight. So I'm just giving you a little bit of preview of what we're going to be covering so that you can know where we're going. Then we'll go through it, and then we'll review it again. Okay? So, seven angels stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. That's the first verse. That's the introduction. Then we see the vision of Jesus Christ, the altar, the golden censer. We see the incense. We see the prayers of the saints, the golden altar, and the throne. All of this is symbolism from the sanctuary. So when we go to the sanctuary, we see what the symbolism means. It's pointing to Christ. It's pointing to his mediation. So we identified all of these symbols. The incense coming up with the prayers of the saints, the sending out of, uh, up before God out of the angels' hands. We identified the incense as the sacrifice of Jesus. We identified the altar as the cross or Calvary where Jesus was sacrificed. And then the golden altar directs us into the sanctuary. So Jesus went to the cross. He died for our sins. He rose again. That's what this day commemorates. And in the heavenly sanctuary, he takes the merits of his sacrifice and he applies them there to our prayers. So when we give our hearts to Jesus, when we give our sins to Jesus, he covers us with his righteousness. We stand perfect before God because of him, not because of us. And so God, and sometimes God has to remind us that we're imperfect. Have you ever noticed that? You know, we're going along, we're doing pretty good. I was doing really well before I got married. I was almost ready for translation. And after I got married, I began to notice a few things <laughs> in myself that I hadn't noticed before. You know, when you live by yourself, there are things that you don't notice about yourself. But when you start living with other people or hanging around with other people, well, things change. And, and as we realize these imperfections in our characters, we go again to Jesus. This isn't a one-time thing. I was saved, you know, in 1967, and I've been that way ever since. No, we continue to give our hearts to Christ. We continue to give him our sins, our shortcomings, and he continues to give us his righteousness and his merit. 
And that's what Revelation 8 is directing us to. Before any of this history, it's directing us to Jesus, to his mediation, his intercession, his continual watch care over us. We see that in the churches also, and we see it in the seals. So Calvary is there at the altar. That sanctuary service immediately directs us to the cross, to the place where Jesus died. And then it takes us from that altar into the holy place. It takes us in symbolism into the heavenly sanctuary. The heavenly sanctuary is not a symbol, but this is a symbol of the heavenly sanctuary. So we see another angel, and we're just putting in our symbols now, reading the verse again with the symbols inside. We see another angel. He comes and he stands at the altar of the cross. He has a golden censer that was given unto him much incense, the merits of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints, all the saints upon the golden altar that is in the heavenly sanctuary, which is before the throne. And the angel takes the censer, fills it with fire off the altar, casts it into the earth. And there's voices, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. We identify these symbols. We saw that the fire of the altar represents cleansing. It represents forgiveness, preparation for a message. Isaiah chapter 6. Fire represents the Holy Spirit. Voices speaking in different languages and tongues and speaking with boldness. And then thunderings represent the voice of God. We also saw in the context that lightnings represent angels and an earthquake, God's power. All of this has already been presented to us in the seals. As you go into Revelation 4, you look at the throne of God. It's there in Revelation 4. And you see around this throne these same symbols. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings, thunders, and voices. Revelation 4, verse 5. This is a symbol, a representation of the power that surrounds the throne of God. And God is taking that power and he's pouring it out on the earth. He's casting it into the earth. He wants to fill us with the very power that is around his throne. He wants to fill us with his very presence and with his spirit. So, it says in Revelation 4 that there were voices, lightnings, thunders, and voices around the throne, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, symbolic, but at the same time telling us this is the holy place. That's where the seven lamps are. And they are the seven spirits of God. So the seven spirits of God in Revelation 4 are pictured as before the throne. Then you get to Revelation 5, verse 6. We see in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, a lamb as it had been slain. That is a representation of the cross again. So the seals has a representation of the cross. The trumpets has a representation of the cross. But notice what happens after we see the cross. We see the seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now we can't catch and understand all the symbolism here, but the point is this. Before Jesus is crucified, the Spirit of God is there in heaven. After Jesus is crucified and he ascends to heaven, the Spirit of God is sent forth into the earth. Jesus made it very simple. He says, you know, I'm going back to heaven. And the disciple says, oh, we don't want you to leave. And he says, no, I, it's expedient for me to go because if I go to heaven, I can send the Holy Spirit to be with you. That's what Revelation is teaching. The symbolism here is teaching us that very simple fact, that very simple truth. Okay, so let's look at it. I'm writing it out now. I'm, I'm putting the symbols into the verse so that it's easier to understand. Okay? The angel took the censer, filled it with fire, Holy Spirit, from the altar, cast it into the earth. And there were voices, the gift of languages, boldness, and thunderings, God's voice, and lightnings, angels, and an earthquake, God's power. All of this was manifested in the early apostolic church. All of it is historically accountable in the book of Acts. In the Bible, you can see all of the manifestations of God's power and angels delivering God's people and them speaking with tongues and speaking with boldness. So all of these symbols actually were manifested in God's church. That history is going to be repeated. God wants to pour out His Spirit on us today. He wants to fill us with the Spirit today. He wants to set us on fire today. He wants us to cooperate with angels today. His power is going to be manifested in the world today. God wants that same manifestation of that early church activity in our lives, in our churches, in our world today. And he's waiting, waiting, waiting. He's just longing to pour out his spirit. He's not withholding it. He's just sitting on the edge, just waiting for a people who will do what the early disciples did, and that is simply ask God for the outpouring of that spirit. The reason why we are so inactive and, 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 and lacking power and lacking motivation is because we're depending on ourselves. We're looking to ourselves. And when the word of God speaks to us, we think, oh, me, oh, my, I don't think I can do that. I'm not sure I can handle that. I'm not sure I can pray for Obama. 
Yes, that's true. We can't. We can't. And so what we need to do is we need to say, Lord, I can't be that. I don't like that guy. I don't want to pray for that person. I don't, want to, I don't think I can accomplish X, Y, and Z, whatever it is. And God says, you can't, but I can't. See, the Bible says Jesus could do nothing of himself. Isn't that right? But he relied on the Father. And we can rely on the Father too. And when we rely on God, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now, if we will believe that, it can happen. But if Satan can stop us from even believing it, there's no way it can happen. So the first step is to ask God. This is what you can say to God. You can say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And then you're on the journey. You're moving forward. And you're going to see miracles work in your life. It's going to be powerful what God is going to do. So the seven angels has had the seven trumpets prepare themselves to sound. Now notice, God first pours out his spirit, warns the world. This is going back to the apostolic time. The gospel is preached to every nation under heaven. I'm talking about Matthew 24 now and verse 15. That already had a fulfillment once. It's going to be fulfilled again, of course. And then we saw the fall of Jerusalem. If you follow Matthew 24, you find that the gospel is preached to every nation. Then the end of Jerusalem comes as a nation. And then you see the warning of the abomination of desolation. And God's people were to flee from Jerusalem. Matthew 24, very clear. That's going to be repeated in our time. We're going to see the same things taking place. First, God wants to warn. And then the judgments follow. And so that's what we're seeing here in the history. We're seeing these angels preparing themselves to sound because the gospel has been preached, preached, preached. Okay, we're in the gospel preaching time right now. The angels are sounding trumpets, which are messages of battle, alarm, warning, coming judgment, day of atonement. That's what the symbolism of these trumpets is. All through the Bible, we find these symbols identified. Joel 2, Zechariah, excuse me, Zephaniah, Jeremiah, Leviticus, identifies that these trumpets represent these different aspects. And so as you go through the trumpets, you can see all of these different aspects are involved. Warning, battle, alarm, call for day of atonement. All of this is involved in the blowing of the trumpets. God is calling us. God is warning us. We're going to see all of this in the history of the trumpets as they're sounded. So the first angel sounds. There follows hail and fire and mingle with blood. They were cast upon the earth. Now, again, we're still reviewing. We're still going over what we've covered last night. And the third part of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. And the first angel sounds and there's hail and fire and blood and it's cast upon the earth and green grass. These were the symbols we looked up. Hail represents battle, war, destruction. Fire that is mingled, test, and judgment. Blood represents death, and the third part represents those who were deceived. And then the trees, leaders, and nations. We saw that the, the, the nation of Israel was likened unto an olive tree, and the nation of the Gentiles was likened unto a wild olive tree. And then burned up means destroyed, and green grass means people, specifically wicked people. These were the symbols we identified last night. And so when we put these into the verse, this is how it comes out. The first angel sounds, and there followed hail, battle, war, destruction, and fire, judgment, mingled with blood, death, and they were cast upon the earth. And the third part, those who were deceived of the trees, leaders in the Jewish nation were burned up, destroyed, and all the green grass, people that were wicked, were burned up. Not one Christian lost their lives in the destruction of Jerusalem. God had his hand over his people. God wants to have his hand over God, his people today so that we can see this history and we can know that it's a type of the end of the world, but God is going to deliver us. That's what it says in Daniel chapter 12. It says, when Michael stands up, that great prince which stands for the children of your people, there's going to be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And at that time, God's people will be delivered. Every one that is written in the book. Every single one. So we're going to see this repeat, but we're going to see again God put his hand over his people. Sometimes we're so worried about the time of trouble. Oh, I'm so scared about the time. Don't be. God has promised that he's going to deliver us in the time of trouble. Every one of us. So what do you need to be focused on? Daniel 12, 1 tells us that our focus needs to be on making sure our names are written in the book. We need to be in the book. And that's not necessarily the church role. <laughs> the book that's being talked about there is the book of life. And Malachi 3 tells us that the way we find ourselves written in that book is by beholding Jesus. By thinking upon his name. 
Those that fear the Lord and thought upon his name, there, there is a book of remembrance written for those that think upon the name of the Lord. See, Satan wants to get you distracted. He wants to get you thinking about focusing on all of the things that are happening in the world today, all of life's cares, perplexities, and sorrows, maybe other people's faults or maybe your own faults and imperfections. He will try to get you directed to any of these devices. Don't be misled. Don't be misled. Keep your focus on Jesus. That's what Revelation is teaching us. He's the lamb and he's going to lead us. And we need to follow him wherever he goes. Wherever he goes, just keep your focus on Jesus. 27 years ago, when I first became a Christian and then became an Adventist, trying to get my sister out of the Adventist church is how I got in. A little lady told me, she said, James, don't look at the people. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, I didn't follow that counsel for a while. And I found myself getting very discouraged when I began to see faults and imperfections in people who were attending church. But then when I got my eyes back on Jesus, it all came together. It wasn't my job to find fault. It was my job to help. And as Jesus fills us with his grace, we look at other people and their mistakes and we try to help them and we encourage them and we pray for them rather than, than uh, judging them and criticizing them or becoming discouraged because of their failures. So keep your focus on Jesus. Summary, war and battle, hail, are waged against Jerusalem as a judgment fire by the Roman armies. Leaders, the nations of Israel, trees, people, the grass, are deceived, third part, by Satan. They die, that's the blood, in the Roman siege through pestilence, hunger, and the sword. Jerusalem is plowed like a field, and over a million Jews are killed. The rest are taken captive, that's all the green grass, later to be thrown to wild beasts, made slaves, or scattered among the nations. That's a summary of the first trumpet. Now we're going to move tonight to the second trumpet. We're done with our summary. We're done with our review. We're moving into the second trumpet. Are you with me? Okay, here we go. And the second angel sounded, and I saw, as it were, a great mountain burning with fire. And it was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And we need to look at some of the symbols here, identify them. Now, you can choose any symbols to identify. I've picked out specific ones. The great mountain that's burning with fire, that's cast into the sea, the third part in blood. Those are the symbols that, I've, that I want to identify as I look through this uh, symbol, this, this, this verse, this symbolic verse. Now, again, I don't think it's literal because when you read it, you look at this, a great mountain burning with fire, cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea becomes blood. If you read that literally, it has to be literal blood as the mountain is cast into the sea. You have to read the whole thing literally if you're going to take it literally. So this is why I believe this is symbolic. If it's symbolic, the Bible has to identify the symbols, and once they're identified, it needs to make sense literally, and it needs to fit into history. So those are two ways that we can check and make sure. First of all, does the Bible give us the symbols? And second, does it fit the literal definition fit into history, especially the history following the fall of Jerusalem. And I believe it does. I believe this verse symbolizes the fall of pagan Rome. Let's take a closer look. Okay, a mountain. What does a mountain represent in Bible prophecy? There's a verse in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. It talks about a stone that smote the image at the feet, and it became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Okay, this stone is Jesus... And as it hits the image, which represents all the nations of this world, this stone becomes a great mountain. That represents the kingdom of Christ that fills the earth. The kingdom of Christ is going to take the place of all the kingdoms of this world. So in the Bible, a mountain is used to symbolize or represent a kingdom. Daniel 2 and verse 35. So a mountain symbolizes a kingdom. Okay? Great. Now that word great... I just looked it up. Sometimes if you look up words in the Greek or Hebrew, you're going to find some, some, some insights that's going to be helpful. And I looked up this word, and I did find some insights that I thought would be helpful. In fact, I found a lot of definitions for this word in the Greek. So here's one of them. Here's the whole thing, but I'm going to emphasize one of them right now. This kingdom, symbolized by this mountain, is a kingdom that is described as great, which means it's long of stature and age. It's an old kingdom. Okay, And I did some research. I went back to our scenario of the kingdoms in the book of Revelation and Daniel. There are four kingdoms mentioned in Daniel. There are four kingdoms mentioned in Revelation. Revelation 13 picks up the sea beast that has the characteristics of each of these kingdoms. And I began to look at their length. The first kingdom, the kingdom of Babylon, like a lion, uh, lasted about 60 years. So uh, that's not really a long time. It's not really an old kingdom. The second kingdom, Medo-Persia, a little bit longer, 200 years. Okay, 
The third kingdom, Greece, a little under 200 years, all right? But the fourth kingdom, the Roman kingdom, guess what? It was the longest one. It was the oldest one. This one went for over 600 years. So there's the first attachment to the kingdom of Rome. It's a great kingdom. That means it's an old or long kingdom, long-lasting kingdom. But here's another definition of, of great. It also means violent, mighty, and strong. Violent, mighty, and strong. Was the Roman kingdom not only a long kingdom in age, but was it violent, mighty, and strong? This is what the Bible says. The Bible says, After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and exceedingly strong. And it had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. It had ten horns. So yes, it fits the definition. We have here a kingdom that's not only old and long, but it's also a kingdom that was violent and strong. But here's another definition of the word that I found. This word great means derogatory to the majesty of God. This was a kingdom that was specifically derogatory to God's majesty. Did the Roman kingdom fill this description? Yes, specifically when Christ came. They mocked him and they crucified him. They were specifically derogatory to the majesty of Jesus Christ. And that is what we see in the context of that word great. It represents a long, old kingdom. It represents a kingdom that was violent and strong and a kingdom that was derogatory to the majesty of God. Rome fits all of that. Rome fits all of that. So then the next phrase here, burning with fire, what does that mean? Well, you go into the Bible, it's very clear. Jeremiah is talking about a mountain symbolically in Jeremiah chapter 51. He says, Behold, I'm against you, O destroying mountain who destroys all the earth, says the Lord. Now, is Jeremiah talking about a literal mountain here? No, it's not a literal mountain destroying the earth. He's talking here in symbolic language. He's talking about a nation. He's talking about a kingdom, and it's, it's likened unto a mountain. This kingdom specifically is Babylon, and it's a destroying mountain, and God says, I'm against you, O destroying mountain. You've been destroying the earth. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stretch out my hand, and I'm going to be against you. I'm going to roll you down from the rocks, and I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. And that means that God is going to bring this kingdom to an end. That's what it means. So when you look in Revelation, and you see a burning mountain, it's a representation of God bringing a kingdom to an end. He's bringing the reign of a kingdom to an end. So that's what that symbol represents, burning with fire. A mountain burning with fire is a mountain, who, uh, a kingdom whose reign ends. And then it says it was cast. Now, this word I looked up in the Greek, it means to scatter or to throw. Very easy, very simple to understand. This kingdom is going to be scattered. It's going to be thrown. When it's brought to an end, it's going to be scattered. Okay? Where is it going to be scattered? It's going to be scattered into the sea. That's what it says. It's going to be scattered into the sea. What does sea represent? Well, in Bible prophecy, seas represents peoples, nations, multitudes, and tongues. In other words, when this kingdom is brought to an end, it's going to be scattered among the peoples and nations and multitudes and tongues. Did that happen to Rome? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was scattered among the nations of Europe. We know that, that it fell into those ten horns and became part of the nations of Europe. We're getting a little bit ahead of myself here. But the ten horns are the ten kings who shall rise from this kingdom. They were broken up into these ten kingdoms, and the Vandals and the Heruli and the Ostrogoths were all destroyed eventually, and the little horn came up in the place of those three. So when Rome came to an end, when its reign came to an end, it was symbolically cast into the sea. It was thrown among the nations of Europe, the people's multitudes and nations of Europe. That's how it came to its end. And then, of course, it says the third part, and that represents those who are deceived in blood, which represents death. We've already looked at those, defined those symbols, so we won't go through them again. So here's a summary of the verse, okay? As we read it through, in the, the context of the symbols, we're going to in, uh, implant the symbols in there as we read it through. The second angel sounded, and as it were, a great, that is a long, old, violent, strong, de uh, uh, de <laughs> de degratory to, the, to God, uh, mountain kingdom, burning with fire, his reign is ending, is cast, scattered into the sea among the nations, peoples, and tongues, and the third part, those who were deceived of the nations and peoples became blood be or died, came to an end. Okay, that is the symbolism of the first part of the second trumpet. Now, it goes on from there. It doesn't end right there, but let's summarize this. When the long iron reign of papal Rome came to an end, it was not conquered by another single power or nation, but it was swallowed up by the seas of peoples and nations and multitudes and tongues. That's what we've got so far. Pagan Rome is coming to an end, and it's scattered among the nations. Now, notice what takes place as we continue. And this is interesting because... 
Jesus, let me just do an aside here. Jesus in Matthew 21 is speaking to his disciples. And he makes this interesting statement that I had never understood in this context, in this prophetic context. He says, Jesus says, Surely I say unto you, if you have faith and you do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, which was a symbol of the Jewish nation. And remember that Jesus cursed the fig tree, which was leading toward what was going to happen with Jerusalem. But you will also say to this mountain, which I believe is a symbol of pagan Rome, be removed and be cast into the sea, and it will be done. I believe Jesus here is speaking in figurative language about faith. There were two specific kingdoms or nations that the early church had to overcome, the Jews and the Romans. And they worked together to destroy the Christian church. Now understand, when Paul went to persecute the Christian church, he was part of a concerted effort to wipe out the Christians. The Jews and the Romans were working together to wipe out Christians. In fact, that's why Paul ended up dying, because the Jews and the Romans got together, and eventually he was beheaded under Nero. So Jesus is saying, you need to have faith. If you have faith, you can overcome not only the persecution of the Jews, but you can also come to overcome the persecution of the Romans. There's religious persecution and there's secular persecution. Now, today, these verses apply to us, okay? We also have to overcome religious persecution and we also have to overcome secular persecution. As believers in Christ, as we witness, as we share, we meet with other individuals who are maybe of different denominations or different faiths or different belief systems, and we have to have faith. Also, we meet with people who are secular, who are out in the world, and we also have to have faith in overcoming them. Those influences come in, okay? So my daughter says to me, for example, Daddy, how come we don't have an Easter egg hunt? Now, you've got to understand, she went to a church where they had an Easter egg hunt. It was an Adventist church. How come we don't do Easter egg hunts? That is the influence of other religions, religious people who have these practices that are pagan, <laughs> you understand, where that comes from, the God of fertility and all that kind of stuff, and we don't follow those practices. But it's going to take some faith for us and for our children because it's hard. Now, before I had kids, like I said, it was, it was easier to be translated <laughs> because I didn't have to deal with Easter. I made up my mind, no big deal. But now I got kids, you see, and Easter and Christmas become big deals. They become more difficult, more challenging, don't they? Yes, and then, of course, you've got the secular world, and it's beating down our door also. It's telling us, you know, that, you know, you need this, you need that, you need the other thing. Don't be so strict, don't be so conformist, don't be so peculiar. All of these influences are coming against us today. Why? Because Satan wants to destroy the Christian faith. He wants to destroy the faith of God's people in these last days. So the history of the early church, going to be repeating at the end of time, Jesus' admonition to them, Matthew 21, 21, is to us also. It can be cast into the sea. All right, 8 verse 9, Revelation 8 verse 9 is the second part of the second trumpet. We're not finished yet. The third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died, and the third part of ships were destroyed. So when pagan Rome falls, something else takes place here. Now this could be understood literally. Many people have identified this as literal, the third part of creatures in the sea and had life died. So there's all these creatures in the sea and one third of them died. Now, I don't know how they counted a third of the creatures in the sea and figured out that you know, a third of them died. I'm not sure. But I, again, think this is symbolic. It's more difficult and more challenging. But I think that as you, I, as you establish symbolism in the first part of this uh, series, you follow it all the way through. And I think it can make sense. Okay, what does it mean? Well, let's identify what creatures and ships mean. We know the people's... Or seas represent peoples and nations, and the third part of those who are deceived. Creatures. What are creatures? Well, there's different ways to understand this, but there's a verse, a very simple verse, in Colossians 1.23, where Paul identifies creatures as people who heard the gospel. He says, If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. What do you think of that verse? You kind of have to believe that by faith, don't you? I do. Every creature under heaven, that's what Matthew 24 was talking about, by the way. Before the destruction of Jerusalem in verse 15, we're told, and, and 16, we're told that the gospel would go to all the world, to all nations, as a witness, and then the end would come. And that has an application to the Jewish nation. 
the destruction of Jerusalem. So Paul says it was fulfilled. He said the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven. Can you imagine? How could 12 people do that? I mean, I know there were more people than that, but you know, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, how could they do that? I mean, if you were to sit down today and figure out what it would take to preach the gospel to everyone in the world as a church, what kind of money would you think it would take? What kind of, of, of effort would you think it would take? See, we think in worldly terms. The disciples thought in heavenly terms. And all it took was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit was outpoured, guess what? They were filled with God, and they preached the gospel to every creature under heaven. It went everywhere. It went ev- as a witness. It turned the world upside down. The Jews said, these guys are turning the world upside down. They heard about it from one end to the other. There were people in Nero, in the kingdom of Rome, in Nero's household, who were becoming Christians, who were giving their lives to Jesus. And as they were persecuted, their blood was seed for the gospel. It went everywhere. That's what took place under the proclamation of the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, every creature, creatures are those who heard the gospel preached. What about ships? Can that be understood symbolically? Well, the Bible actually does use this phrase symbolically. Look at this, if you will. Is 1 Timothy 1.19, first of all, there's two verses here. 1 Timothy 1.19, holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. So having faith, having faith is likened unto being a ship, and giving up your faith is like, likened unto being shipwrecked. See, we people that have faith are likened unto ships. In fact, the church is symbolized by a ship. You know, the ship's going through. You ever heard that phrase? The ship's going through. Stay with the ship. The ship's going through. See, it's right from the Bible, right from these verses. Look at this other verse with me. This one also uh, reveals the symbolism of ships. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil. Anchors, where do you get those? On ships, okay? So if we are symbolized as ships, then we have anchors. And the anchor of our soul is who? Jesus is the anchor of our soul, steadfast and sure. So the Bible uses ships to symbolize people who have faith in Jesus, people who are anchored in the truth. Were people who had faith in Jesus destroyed when pagan Roman fe- Roman, Rome fell? Let's take a look. So ships represents those who have faith in Jesus Christ, seas, peoples, and nations, third part, those who are deceived. Let's take a look now at the verse. And the third part, those who are deceived, of the creatures, of those who heard the gospel that were in the sea among the peoples and nations and had life, died. And the third part of the ships, those who had faith, were destroyed. In other words, when pagan Rome fell... It came in to the Christian church. A compromise took place among people who had heard the gospel, people who had faith in Jesus, people who were anchored. And over time, the Christian church began to compromise that faith. And many of those people lost their faith. They were shipwrecked. They were destroyed. They died. They had life. They believed in Jesus, but they compromised that faith, and they lost their faith in Jesus Christ. Is that the history that took place as pagan Rome fell? Let's summarize it. As pagan Rome fell, paganism moved into the church. Many people who had the gospel preached to them were deceived. Others made shipwreck of their faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at this again in the context of the great controversy. Now remember, last night we talked about the great controversy. It's an inspired commentary, I believe, on the book of Revelation. If you will take the trumpets and follow them historically, you're going to find that the great controversy follows that exact outline. From the fall of Jerusalem, first chapter, the compromise with paganism, pagan Rome coming into the church, all the way through to the rise of Catholicism, papacy, and the Reformation, and the rise of Islam, and the Millerite movement, and atheism, and the second coming of Jesus Christ. It moves all the way through the outline of the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets takes up the largest section in the book of Revelation. And Great Controversy is a commentary on them. Now notice this. As we move through this, we already saw... The destruction of Jerusalem under the first trumpet, first chapter in Great Controversy. What follows the destruction of Jerusalem in the Great Controversy? Would it be the fall of pagan Rome and the compromise of the Christian faith? Okay, Great Controversy, chapter 1, first pages, pages 1 through about 30, talking about the fall of Jerusalem. Now we pick up in the next chapter. Notice what it says here. Satan therefore laid his plans to war 
more aggressively against the government of God by planting his banner where? Inside the Christian church. Inside the Christian church. So as paganism falls, as it becomes dispersed among the nations, guess what happens? Constantine rises up. These emperors rise up, and they begin to bring paganism into the church. Satan is working through this to plant his banner inside the Christian church and destroy the faith, the ships, those who had heard the gospel, the creatures, those who had heard the gospel preached unto them, destroy their faith. If the followers of Christ could be deceived, that's the third part again, deceived, and led to displease God, then their strength, their fortitude, their firmness would fail, and they would fall an easy prey. So Satan's working today. He wants to bring in these pagan festivals, you know, Easter egg hunt in the church, some of these pagan festivals. He wants to bring them into the church, compromise our faith, pull us down away from the clear, straight, powerful word of God and put more of our confidence in the things of this world, put more of our confidence in the forms and traditions of people and take us away from the word of God. The further we depart from the word of God, the less power we have. The less power we have, the less power we have. And then we uh, begin to think that there is no power in the Bible. There is no power in the Word of God. And we look to the church, we look to the world, we look to all of these things that we can invent for power because we don't have any realization of, of where our power really comes from. We've disconnected from the power of God's Word. That's what Satan wants to do by bringing the world into the church. So we have all this stuff coming into church today whether it's music, whether it's entertainment, whatever it is, to separate us from the word of God and the power of God's word. Okay, the great adversary now endeavored to gain by artifice what he had failed to secure by force. So he's trying to deceive God's followers in the early Christian church. Persecution ceased, and in its stead were substituted the dangerous allurements of temporal prosperity and worldly honor. That's where our focus is. That's where Satan wants to get us uh, deceived. Idolaters were led to receive a part of the Christian faith while they rejected other essential truths. Oh, he believes in Jesus. He wants to be baptized. He's accepted Christ. But the other essentials, we need to kind of push them out of the way. They're not important. They're not as significant. So part of the Christian faith, other things, ah, they're kind of excluded. A compromise took place in the early Christian church. Satan wants to do things same thing today. Now remember, compromise begins not in him or her, but in me. <laughs> it starts with me, okay? It's easy for us to say, oh, I know what, what's happening. I know who's compromising. I know where the... Co no, where am I compromising? What's happening in my life? Where is it that Satan's coming in in my own walk with Jesus and causing me to separate from him? Just a little bit. I'll give you an example. When I was, some years ago, when I was first getting into the internet, I remember I, I got a little line from CNN, and they would send me this little update, you know, and I would just, it was, it was just a little blurb, it gave you the basic main news, you know, and, and all the sports updates, and, and I, it would tell you oh, five minutes, I would just read through it in five minutes, you know, oh, five minutes. And then, as time went on, I oh, well, 10, 15 minutes, you know, I was following up on some of the stories, and I'd go to the links and look at the, the full story, and, and I wanted to keep up with it, you know, kind of like a soap opera, you know, you saw what was happening yesterday, you want to see what's happening today. Pretty soon, I was spending 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour <laughs> following all the stories and checking out what's going on in the world. And, you know, I don't even remember the stuff today that I was reading. Don't even remember it. It's insignificant in the eternal realities of what God wants. It's insignificant. And let me tell you something. If something major happens, you're going to hear about it. You don't need to be glued to your television. You don't need to be watching the news every single day after day, hour after hour. That is one of the ways that Satan tried to come in and separate me because I found myself spending less time with Jesus because I was spending more time with CNN. So are there things in your life where, Christ, or excuse me, where Satan is coming in to compromise your relationship with Jesus? Where you're not spending time in prayer, you're not spending time in study, and you don't feel like you have strength or power, you don't feel like you're having a good experience, and you're wondering why. Maybe it's because you've disconnected. Maybe it's because that connection's not there. Jesus says, abide in me, and I in you, and your joy will be full. That's what God wants for us, to reconnect with him. Great Controversy 42. Then, going on, most of the Christians at last consented to lower the standards. So, you see, this, this happened over time. There was a war taking place, a battle taking place, and after a while, many of the Christians consented to lower their standard. A union was formed between Christianity and paganism. Okay, that's what took place in the church. Unsound doctrines, superstitious rites, idolatrous ceremonies were incorporated into the faith and worship. 
And that's where we see some of these practices even today. Even today, we see some of these practices. Now, we shouldn't ignore Easter. Easter is a very important time of the year. It's a memorial of what Jesus Christ has done for us. We don't ignore it. But I'm not going to go hunting for Easter eggs. I'm not going to be having my kids doing that either. That has nothing to do with Easter. <laughs> that has to do with the fertility goddess. Okay? So there's, there's definitely a distinction here. Same with Christmas. Christmas is an awesome opportunity to remember that Jesus came into this world to remember people and minister to people. It has nothing to do with Santa Claus. Okay, nothing to do with that. Okay, Santa Claus is a counterfeit of Christ. If you think about all the things, you know, he knows if you're naughty or nice, he's bringing you presents, he's coming at midnight, he's in the North Pole, all of those things. You know, they're count so people are in love with Santa Claus and they don't have anything to do with Jesus. Jesus is much more valuable than anything that Santa Claus can give to you. And so I'm not going to raise my kids to believe in Santa Claus. I'm going to raise them to believe in Jesus. I want them to, to believe in Jesus. And of course, the reason why, I'm just going to say this as an aside, the reason why I really struggle with Christmas is because as a young man, I was raised believing in Christmas and Santa Claus, and I was devastated, devastated, when I found out there was no Santa Claus. And you know what I did? The first thing I did, in my mind, I said, I can't trust my mom just lost trust in her altogether because she told me this she told me this and it caused me to lose trust in anything she told me you know that is see jesus says there's a childlike faith children have a faith and i believe christmas santa claus is calculated to destroy that faith so that we would lose that trust that childlike trust that we have because we're told the story about santa claus and the tooth fairy and all this kind of stuff and then later on oh that's not true those are just stories and then pretty soon we think the bible is just stories and all that stuff is just stories. just put it all in the same category you see so that's another reason personally my personal experience why i just i don't want anything to do with these idolatrous idolatrous ceremonies that have been incorporated into the, into the church as the followers of christ united with idolaters the christian religion became corrupted and the church lost her purity and her power. The church lost her purity and her power. There were some, however, who were not misled by these, what? Delusions, deceptions. Third part deceived. Those who were deceived, but there were others who were not. And they still maintained their fidelity to the author of truth and worshipped God alone. That's Great Controversy, page 43. That's where God wants us to be today. When Christians consented to unite with those who were about half converted from paganism, they entered upon a path which led them further and further from the truth. It's one little compromise after another after another. That's how Satan leads us away. It's not going to be necessarily a bold one. It's just going to be a little one, and then a little, another little one, and then another little one, and pretty soon we find ourselves way over on the other side of truth. Okay? Satan exalted that he has succeeded in what? Deceiving, there's the third part again. Deceiving so large a number of the followers of Christ. Wow, I didn't think this was going to work so well. That's what Satan is saying. I didn't realize that this was going to work so well. He then brought his power to bear more fully upon these and inspired them to persecute those who remain true to God. Unfortunately, many times our greatest dangers come from those inside the church. Those inside the church. So we need to remember the history because we're going to be repeating it. Great Controversy, page 45. So let's summarize in closing. Let's summarize what we've learned so far so that we can see if it can... I mean, I know this is challenging, but if we can go over this, summarize it, move through it, and then if you can get the outlines, I think it, it can be understand, understood, it can become clearer to you. We begin the seven trumpets with a picture of Christ mediating the heavenly sanctuary. That's what opens up this history to us. We see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, Revelation 8, verse 5, Pentecost, early church. Then we have the warnings, preparing to sound. God has sent the gospel to all the world. Now he's giving the warning messages. He's showing us the judgments that are coming upon these different nations. First, we see the fall of Jerusalem in uh, A.D. 70, Judaism. And then in Revelation 8, verses 8 and 9, the second trumpet sounds, and we see the fall of pagan Rome, and we see Christians compromising with paganism. So let's look at the parallels again. Repeat and enlarge seven churches. First church is Ephesus. Gospel goes to all the world. Apostolic era. Seals. First horse. White horse. Gospel goes to all the world. Apostolic era. Trumpets. Prelude to the trumpets. Pentecost. Gospel goes to all the world. Apostolic era. Then we get to the second part. We have the second church. Smyrna. Pagan Rome. We have the seals. Second horse. Red horse. Pagan Rome. And then we have the trumpets. First and second trumpet. The fall of Jerusalem. Pagan Rome pagan era again. So it's a perfect parallel. You're going to see this develop, this chart develop as we go through this. I shared this earlier, but we're, we're going to go through it again. 
This chart is an outline, again, of the church's seals and trumpets, the parallel of these uh, in, in each era, the apostolic age, the pagan Roman era, and then we see the basic outline of salvation that opens up each one of them. Churches, incarnation. Christ is among the churches. He's with the seven churches. He's with us, God with us. Then we see in the seals, the crucifixion, the lamb slain in the midst of the throne. So Jesus Christ there presented as a crucified lamb. And then in, in the trumpets, we see him interceding and mingling the incense with the prayers of the saints. So it's the incarnation, crucifixion, and intercession of Jesus that opens up each one of these visions. It begins in John's time. It begins in the apostolic age. And then it's going to take us all the way down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Each one of these visions is going to end with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to see when we're done. We're going to fill out this complete chart. We're going to see each age pale on each other. And we're going to see all of them taking us all the way down to the second coming of Jesus. Something to look forward to.